The big news of the day, of course, is the Senate confirmation hearings. These were taking place out of two different committees. Our first story comes from the New York Times, and they were giving us some highlights about what was taking place today. So this was largely stemming around the Capitol Hill riots. There were a lot of investigations going on sort of simultaneously right now. We've got Nancy Pelosi calling for a 9-11-ish style of investigations. We also have sort of a lot of independent agency internal investigations going on. And then today there were there was sort of a, a brief line of questioning from a couple different people who were responsible for security back on January 6. And so we've got some clips. We're going to go through a number of different clips and sort of uh, break down a little bit more about what what's what was going on today. But let's just start with a high level overview and then we'll just dive in there. So number one, we have three former top Capitol security officials and the chief of the Washington police, they all blamed federal law enforcement and the Defense Department on Tuesday for intelligence failures ahead of the January 6th Capitol riot and for slow authorization of the National Guard. So Stephen Sun, somebody we talked about, he resigned as the Capitol Hill police chief. He said, quote, none of the intelligence we received predicted what actually occurred. He called the riot, quote, the worst attack on law enforcement and our democracy that I've ever seen. He also said he witnessed insurrectionists assaulting officers, not only with their fists, but also pipe sticks, bats, metal barricades and flagpoles. He said these criminals came prepared for war. And so a lot of the theme that you'll see here as we go throughout this is basically kind of pointing their fingers at everybody else. Right. You know, we weren't responsible for this. We couldn't expect couldn't have expected this weren't properly trained for this, made requests to other agencies, other law enforcement people. You're going to see a lot of finger pointing going on here today. Uh, you're going to see things that were sort of sent over emails when they should have been maybe a phone call, given the severity of what we were talking about. And so really not many answers, unfortunately. Um, I didn't watch the whole thing, but I, I sort of watched around and clipped around a bit today. And, you know, do we get any do we get any specifics? Do we get any, you know, were there stand down orders who ordered? You know, you're going to see I'm not going to sort of uh, put the cart before the horse here. Let's dive into some of the clips and then we can break it down piece by piece. So this first clip really shows, I think, one of the, the, the narrative shifts that we're seeing out of this entire investigation. So remember, when we rewind the clock back a little bit ago, back to impeachment version 2.0, the big allegation there was Donald Trump get out, got, got out there on January 6th at the Save America rally, and he was inciting. Remember that? Inciting, inciting, inciting. Everything that, he came, that came out of his mouth that day was incitement for the insurrection. And it was all sort of, you know, sort of this idea here that, Trump was creating this pressure cooker with a lot of his rhetoric post November 3rd, basically challenging the election, saying that there was all sorts of malfeasance going on there. And what he was doing is he was creating an environment that was incendiary, that was just ready to explode with the lighting of a match. And we heard a lot of that phraseology in the impeachment proceedings. And so that was the narrative during the impeachment. Trump was kind of building this thing, and then he got there on January 6th, lit that spark, and boom, the whole thing exploded. But the narrative shifts a little bit today. Now it's all about this was really pre-planned. This was not just you know incitement. He didn't show up there and just scream something, and then everybody got got really you know riled up and incited, and then went and committed that insurrection. What they're talking about here is a pattern of pre-planning. This was all orchestrated, sort of a military style organization taking place. We're going to hear from Steven Sund. And so you're just seeing how the narrative shifts. And so we're going to go through, we're going to play some clips. Then we're going to hear from Amy Klobuchar, who was somebody who was very vocal during the prior impeachments. She's coming out now and saying, well, see, we told you this is all pre-planned. It was clearly insurrection. And so now we're just going to see how this pivots so now that Donald Trump, and you watch this through this lens, this is how I sort of am interpreting it. I'm giving you the conclusion before we get even through it, but just watch it through this lens. Are they shifting away now from Donald Trump as the big bad guy, right? A couple of weeks ago when we were talking about impeachment, he incited the insurrection. Well, now it's like, well, he wasn't convicted. He wasn't actually uh, you know, uh, found guilty of the incitement of insurrection. So now the goalposts are changing just a little bit. Now they're saying, oh, it was all pre-planned. It really wasn't much to do with Donald Trump. It was about white supremacy, right? It was about insurrection. 
and the narrative is shifting. So Donald Trump is sort of, we're going to put him back on the shelf back here. Don't need him. He was a useful folly for a little bit of time. Now we're going to shift it back over to the white supremacist and the pre-planned organization that was really responsible for all of this, because that is how the policy is going to shift. Now it's going to be about enforcing uh, racial equity. Now it's going to be about criminalizing and prosecuting all of these individuals for their organized anti-government activity. And we're going to see where that goes. We heard some of that yesterday from Merrick Garland during his attorney general confirmation hearing where he was saying that, yeah, they're going to process, prosecute all of these people, all of these white supremacists. They, they, you know, they're, they're really being uh, prolific with that word. And so let's just see how this narrative is slowly shifting. This a series of clips came over from the Washington Post. So, of course, you want to you want to understand where the clips came from, uh, because as we have brought to everybody's attention, including my own here on this show, the Washington Post really is not a sort of center of the road journalistic entity, but they did a nice job clipping some various clips. But just keep in mind, that, you know, they're, they're picking clips that that serve their narrative. So I just want to put that out there. This is the first clip where we see that there was some definite pre planning taking place as it related to the Capitol Hill riots. Based on the intelligence, we all believed that the plan met the threat and that we were prepared. We now know that we had the wrong plan. Even our best efforts were not enough to stop this unprecedented assault on the Capitol. However, casting blame solely on United States Capitol Police leadership is not only misplaced, but it also minimizes what truly occurred that day. We had planned for the, the, the possibility of violence, the possibility of some people being armed, not the possibility of a coordinated military style attack involving thousands against the Capitol. Uh, as a result of all right, so we're going to get to his clip in a minute. Two things, right? We just heard from the House Sergeant of Arms, the former House Sergeant of Arms, who basically said we weren't planned for it. Right? We, 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 we didn't know, weren't planned for it. We thought we had a plan in place, but it but it, it didn't work out. Okay, which is, I think, understandable, right? Has anything like this happened before? No. Has uh, the U.S. Capitol building been stormed before? Not to my knowledge. I haven't seen that before. So I can understand that, but at the same time, you are the... House Sergeant at Arms, your entire job is security. So was nobody thinking about contingencies on what happens, right? You're, you're dealing with some of the most powerful people in the entire country in one building under one roof. And nobody thought about what might happen if there's a breach of the building or if they're trying to kidnap somebody within the building or hold hostages. I mean, they've never war gamed any of that stuff. I have a hard time believing that, especially in, con in, in in the context of what they were claiming back during those days. This was back during you know mid mid January. A lot of talk about white supremacy. A lot of talk about uh, Enrique Tario, the Proud Boys. Remember, they came up during the debates in the election season, and there was a lot of you know sort of a bluster about that. So if they recognize that this was an ongoing threat, why were they not prepared? And he just says, "Well, we had a plan, and it just didn't work out." All right, so that's thank you. Thank you for that. Then we get over to Stephen Sund, and he's saying the same thing. He's confirming that there was a lot of pre-planning that took place here. And he said it specifically. You just heard it in a military organized-ish fashion, right? He used more articulate words than that, but he basically said that this whole thing was coordinated and they just, they, they weren't prepared for that. They were reg ready for just regular everyday protesters. This looked like they had more coordination, which is basically the exact opposite of what we heard during the impeachment. Even in the article of impeachment, it wasn't just me making this stuff up. In the article of impeachment, the Democrats themselves, the same one that was introduced into the House and they prosecuted Trump with, was all about what Trump said, his specific language. If you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. That was allegedly what caused the insurrection. It was the incitement that led the pressure cooker to explode. Now, oh, that 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 whole narrative is just gone now. Now it's all this was all pre-orchestrated and all pre-planned. Then we're going to get over to the acting D.C. chief of police, and he's basically confirming that as well. Here he is in our next clip. As a result of the ongoing investigation that's being handled uh, by the FBI, uh, you know, as they continue to scrub our uh, social media, I think we're learning more and more and more that this is clearly a coordinated effort. The response was more uh, asking about the plan uh, that, you know, what was the plan for the National Guard? The response was more uh, focused on, uh, in addition to the plan, uh, the optics, you know, the, how this looks uh, with boots on the ground uh, on, the, on the Capitol. And in, in my response to that uh, was simply, I was just stunned. Senator, uh, from my recollection, I did not receive a request for approval for National Guard until shortly after 2 p.m. 
when I was in Michael Stanger's All right, office. Let's, let me get that straightened out, Mr. Sun. So let's back up a minute here. So there were there were two things that I wanted to mention. So we just we just heard that. Well, let me go back here. I'm not sure how I broke this up. Here it is. Let's go back to this clip. Do you know when you asked for National Guard assistance? Was it 109 or was it 2 p.m.? It was 109, sir. 109. And who did you ask for assistance at 109? It was from uh, Mr. Irving. I believe he was in the company of Mr. Stinger at the time as well. And Mr. Irving, why would you not remember that? Senator, I have no recollection of a conversation with Chief Sund. All right, so... So a couple things there. Number one, we just heard from the Metro police, the very first clip, he said that this whole thing was clearly a coordinated effort, right? That was his own language. And so he, he presumably could have been called to testify at the impeachment proceedings. That didn't happen, but it, he said it was clearly a coordinated effort. And then when he went and tried to have a conversation with somebody about the National Guard, they were all talking about the plan rather than dealing with what needed to be done in order to secure the Capitol building. So as you heard him say, he, he went through it and he said they were talking about optics, talking about boots on the ground. And he's, he's sort of having a conversation with this other guy who we just heard from. So we had the uh, Robert J. Conti, the chief of the Metro Police, then he's talking about Paul Irving, who's the far former House Sergeant of Arms, which was Nancy Pelosi's house, right? And, and you can you can make this thing a political thing or not, but the point here is there was some concern. They were talking about it, and then it was a lot of dithering about, well, boots on the ground, what does the plan look like? The optics might be bad. Then we get over to, and I'm not sure if we're going to play this clip again or not. I think I might have kind of botched that, but he says specifically that they they made the request and it, it just wasn't fulfilled. So let's go on to this next clip. Hold on real quickly. Let me see where I'm at. We've received information. All right. So I wanted to play that one more time because there's this interesting exchange that happens between the the House Sergeant of Arms, Sergeant at Arms, and the Capitol Hill Chief of Police, former uh, Stephen Sun. So they're going back and forth and they're having a debate over the of the timing, over when the timing took place. We've received information. All right, I'm not I'm not sure what I'm doing over here. Here we go. As a result of the ongoing investigation that's being handled uh, by the FBI, uh, you know, as they continue to scrub our uh, social media, I think we're learning more and more and more that this is clearly a coordinated effort. The response was more uh, asking about the plan uh, that, you know, what was the plan for the National Guard? The response was more uh, focused on, uh, in addition to the plan, uh, the optics, you know, the, how this looks uh, with boots on the ground uh, on, the, on the Capitol. And in, in my response to that uh, was simply, I was just stunned. Sen All right, so this is where we're going to get into the back and forth between Paul Irving, who is the former House Sergeant, of Ar Sergeant at Arms, and then Stephen Sund, the former chief of the U.S. Capitol Police. And this is where we have some just deliberate finger pointing. So we've got two people who are basically adversarial. We have Paul Irving, who is responsible for security of the House of Representatives. He's a sergeant at arms. We also have the Capitol Hill police officer. And what, they're, what you're going to hear is that they're talking about when the National Guard sort of got the call. When did they make a request for them to come and support what was taking place at the Capitol building? And we're going to hear from Stephen Sund, who says, yeah, I made the request at 109. And they say, you sure? Yeah, 109. I've got it right here. here. Here's the records. But then we go back over to the House Sergeant at Arms, and he's sort of like, well, I don't know, 2 o'clock maybe, right? And Mr. Blunt, who is Roy Blunt out of Missouri, he's trying to pin this stuff down. And so basically what's happening here is there's a there's a 51 minute window that we don't know what was going on as it relates to the National Guard. And, the, you know, that's understandable. Right. They were in the middle of a, a riot. But again, it's just it's just both sides kind of no. I, I, I made the request. Well, I didn't get the request. Did you check your email? I know it was in my spam folder. I didn't get it. Sorry. Whoops. Right. And it's all this. It's, it's just a bureaucratic mess, which is basically what we had suspected. So let's go back to this clip. I apologize for uh, that rough transition there, but here it is. Senator, from my recollection, I did not receive a request for approval for National Guard until shortly after 2 p.m. when I was in Michael Stanger's All right, office. Let's, let me get that straightened out. Mr. Sun, do you know when you asked for National Guard assistance? Was it 109 or was it 2 p.m.? It was 109, sir. 109. And who did you ask for assistance at 109? 
It was from uh, Mr. Irving. I believe he was in the company of Mr. Stinger at the time as well. And Mr. Irving, why would you not remember that? Senator, I have no recollection of a conversation with Chief Sund. All right, so the chief of police, the Capitol Hill chief of police says, yep, 109, I had a conversation with Paul Irving, the House Sergeant at Arms, and I believe Michael Stinger was there, who is the former Sergeant at Arms for the Senate. So I was on the on the call with both people who are responsible for the Capitol building security at 109. We go back over to Paul Irving. Senator, I have no recollection of any of that. So, all right, is that... Is that answer satisfactory to you? Okay. You know, this is why I think Nancy Pelosi's onto something when she says that maybe we should have a 9-11-ish style commission. Now, I'm not sure we're going to get any more answers other than this. If if Mr. Irving doesn't remember it now, he's not going to remember it in a more in-depth commission. But maybe, maybe they'll dig it up and he'll come up with some sort of an answer on that. You would imagine that if Stephen Sun, the former Capitol Hill chief of police, is on the phone with them, and he remembers the date and what he's what is being said. You would imagine that the two other people on the other side of that phone line would also have recollection about that. In this next clip that we're going to get to, we see here that basically it's a training problem. Also, you know, they just weren't trained for a situation like this, which which again is just sort of mind boggling. You know, the amount of resources, the amount of security briefing that goes into this place. I mean, haven't they seen? What is it? Olympus has fallen, right? D didn't didn't Gerard Butler make some movies about this stuff, about taking over the White House, taking over whatever buildings around the world? Did nobody watch that insecurity on Capitol Hill, Hill? So here's this next clip saying they don't have good training. We've received information that prior to January 6th, Capitol Police officers were not trained on how to respond to an infiltration of the Capitol building. Is that tr correct, Mr. Sund? When you talk about infiltration, you talk about a large insurrection like we saw on the January 6th? No. So on that day, you issued rules of engagement that included what specifically? I'm an officer. What was I supposed to do if those, those barricades were breached? There's rules of engagements that exist. They weren't exi uh, issued just that day. They existed. In they don't vary from event to event based on threat analysis? No, sir. Yeah, so a couple hard clips over there from the Washington Post. You know, what I would like to know is... Did did, uh, did he just say that they have basically no contingency plan if somebody breaches a barrier, right? They set up barriers to protect the Capitol building. Do they not have a plan B if those barriers get broken? I mean, that's it, it would seem obvious to me. So he says, no, not on the scale, not on the scope of what we saw on January 6th, which I think is fair, which is which is it is accurate, right? I think this was something that was out of proportion. It was something that had not been foreseen. But at the same time, you would you would you would imagine that they would have some sort of contingency plans. And I'm not a security, into, you know, uh, uh, IC type of person, but it, it, it would just make sense to me that if you're going to have the vice president, 100 senators, 435 House of Representatives, all the staff, everybody in that one building at that one day, date and time, that you would be a little bit more robust in your security. And I just haven't, I haven't really gotten any reassurance from anybody in this hearing that this is a high priority for them. You know, it's just sort of, we had a plan. It was just a bad plan. That's kind of what they're talking about. And we also now have a phone call comment from the Metro chief of police, the Metro DC police. He's basically saying, yeah, we, th there were some concerns that were floating around and it just came over in an email. Maybe they should have given me a phone call. Here he is. What the FBI sent mail on January this, uh, 5th was in the form of an email. Uh, I would certainly think that something as violent as an insurrection of the Capitol uh, would warrant, um, you know, a phone call or something. So on January 5th, they sent an email. Hey, you know, we're concerned about uh, an insurrection at the Capitol. FYI, you know, take a look at this if you get a chance. Maybe they put, please read with stars and asterisks at the top. Please read, you know, because nobody ever reads emails. I don't know, but they didn't call the guy. They didn't call one of the lead security officials in the in dc just an email all right then we get a little bit more that uh they're asking questions about training here's another clip question mr son how can you tell us exactly how the capitol police preparations for january 6th differed from preparations for the protests from last summer and if you can specifically address if they were the same or different use of Ford guidelines in place on January 6th 
compared to the protests of last summer or any criteria for making arrests on January 6th versus the protest from last summer. Okay, and if you could do that in about a minute. Uh, 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 yes, ma'am, I, I, I will do that very concisely. Okay. So I wanna look at it from planning and preparations. We plan for every demonstration the exact same way. Doesn't matter the, the message of the, uh, the person, doesn't matter the demographics of the grievance involved in the demonstration. We do it the exact same way. We develop our information, we develop our intel, and we base a response plan on that. Yeah, so I, I think where that line of questioning was going, that we've seen a lot of this type of narrative in the media that uh, basically all the white cops let all the white people go, right? And that, that was sort of a, a headlines for a long time. I think even Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris even came out and gave a big speech shortly thereafter, hinting at the same thing, sort of, you know, these, these racist white cops were letting all the racist white Trump supporters go, and I've been doing my best to smash that. Uh, that, that, that generalization. We've gone through a lot of arrests. We know that the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Department of Homeland Security, all of these law enforcement agencies, including the Capitol Police, including the Metro Police, including local law enforcement around this country, are doing everything to round up anybody who's even tangentially related to the Capitol Hill riots. Even people who came the day after are being arrested just for their involvement, just for sending text messages across state lines. And so what that other senator was trying to do is just to say, no, yeah, you know, we made some a bunch of changes here because we were sort of lowering the line of enforcement because it was Trump and we like Trump. And that narrative, I think, is disingenuous and not uh, not intellectually honest because that just is not the case. And I think it sort of undermines what the government is trying to do. They're, they are trying to enforce the law, and we want to be sure that they that they do that coherently, and that the people who deserve to be rounded up as a part of this enforcement effort are they're they're the right people, not the grandma who walked in after the fact and was looking around with an American flag going, this is crazy. I'm in the Capitol Hill building, right? She's not an insurrectionist, folks. She may be in trouble for being there, but she's not an insurrectionist and she's not somebody, in my opinion, who should be charged with domestic violent terrorism and given 20 years. There are some people, I think, who are responsible for some pretty heinous things. Anybody laying pipe bombs and, and you know, trying to kill people, I think that's a whole separate issue. But we just got to be very careful because right now they're lumping every, they're over criminalizing everything. And we'll see where that goes. Now, lastly, we get to Miss Klobuchar, who is uh, now coming out and sort of issuing a conclusion at the end of the, the ceremony. And here is how they are reframing it. So let's just sort of rewind the clock and go back to at the beginning of the segment when we were talking about the original narrative being Trump caused this and incited this. Now that's kind of out the window. I don't even think she says Trump's name here. Now she's saying this is organized by white supremacists. It was in fact pre-planned and now they got to deal with that issue. So it's about the remedy. What are they trying to solve here? When Trump was the, the subject of this microscope, the solution was to prevent him from running again. That's really what they wanted. But now that that's not a possibility anymore, at least in the Congress, now they're shifting this. So now they have to sort of adjust the scapegoat to something else, and then they'll pass new policies to address that issue. And so what is Ms. Klobuchar bringing up? Of course, it is uh, white supremacy. Statements at the beginning from all the witnesses. They may have disagreed on some details and, you know, okay. But there is clear agreement that this was a planned insurrection. So, and I think most members here um, uh, very firmly agree with that. Um, and I think it's important for the public to know that. This was planned. We now know this was a planned insurrection. It involved uh, white supremacists. It involved extremist groups. And it certainly could have been so much worse except for the bravery of the officers. All right. So it was totally pre-planned, white supremacists and extremist groups. All right. Didn't even mention Trump in there. Did Trump, did Trump plan that? Like, was he sitting there sending text messages with all these white supremacists and extremist groups? Because it sounded like that was the argument a couple weeks ago, but not so much anymore. Now this was all orchestrated and coordinated by the groups that she mentioned. So some reaction, we saw this posted over today from BeckerNews.com. And this is saying that the ex capitol Police Chief testimony blows up the Dem narrative about Capitol riot attacks. So the former Capitol Police Chief Stephen Stund provided explosive testimony to the U.S. Senate that runs directly against the Democrats' narrative about the Capitol riots. Sund, who was forced to resign, said that the Democrats knew 
there was a high potential for a riot with the capacity for violence. But due to concerns about, quote, the optics of the situation, the House Sergeant at Arms did nothing to stop it. The former Capitol Chief of Police testimony has been indispensable in establishing that there was plenty of advance warning. Sun earlier stated that the House was warned six times about the pending danger. He revealed the resources to the Capitol Police requested including a stronger National Guard presence in a resignation letter aimed directly at Pelosi, which we covered. Furthermore, concrete intelligence from earlier, or earlier December suggested that foreign influence was in the origins of the planned Capitol building assault. It has since been reported by CBS News's Catherine Herridge. So now we got some, what is this, Russian interference? Everyone in D.C. had to have known about the powder keg, just like it was following Trump's election and his inauguration, which also saw violent and destructive rioting. On one hand, so this is analysis now, on one hand, the gap gap between the intelligence indicating the high potential for a riot act, along with far right plans. On the other hand, we have a complete inaction by the House and Senate leadership saying that this is a chasm that raises profound questions. One of the foremost questions regarding what Speaker Pelosi and the Democrats knew about the riot and their concerns about the optics of the events. So we had a couple quotes here from Sund, which we've already basically gone through. It says here, he says, there was a clear lack of accurate and complete intelligence across several federal agencies that contributed to this event and not poor, poor planning by the United States Capitol Police. We rely on accurate information from our federal partners to help us develop effective security plans. So that's a quote from Sun. So once again, just kind of pointing the fingers elsewhere. It might, might be very rightful, right? He, he may be absolutely right, but you're going to see how this goes. All One government agency blaming another. The intelligence that we based our planning on indicated that the January 6th protests were expected to be similar to previous peaceful MAGA rallies, which drew tens of thousands. The assessment indicated that members of the Proud Boys, white supremacist groups, and Antifa and other extremist groups were expected to participate on January 6th and that it may be inclined to become violent. So this was all pre-January 6th intelligence. And this is this is a quote from him today at the hearing. So he specifically calls out the Proud Boys, which for some reason is, a, is considered to be a white supremacist group. But then we also have a different category of white supremacist groups. And we also have Antifa and then other extremist groups were all expected to participate. All right. As recent as Tuesday, January 5th, Sun said, during a meeting I hosted with my executive team, the Capitol Police Board and a dozen of the top law enforcement and military officials from D.C., he said no entity, including the FBI, provided any new intelligence regarding January 6th. It should also be noted that the Secretary of Homeland Security did not issue an elevated or eminent alert in reference to the events at the Capitol on January 6th. We properly planned for mass demonstration with possible violence. What we got was a military-style coordinated assault on my officers and a violent takeover of the Capitol building. So you see how, you know, there was we, we had a little bit of a snippet there. In that Washington Post clip, we, we properly planned for mass demonstration. We got a military style coordinated assault is what he said. But before that, he was talking a lot about basically, uh, you know, the FBI dropped the ball. They didn't tell us anything about this stuff. And what we saw was a military style coordinated attack. What we should have been prepared for based on our intelligence agencies, based on the the billions of billions of dollars that we spend every year to create our intelligence community. They should have known something about this. If it really was that coordinated, they should have known something and they should have alerted him to that fact. And still, who knows what would have been done because apparently he had already requested for additional resources six times, according to this article. So it goes on. It says here that on Tuesday, he told lawmakers he did not receive a copy of an FBI report warning of violence and and. Uh, that was issued the day before the attack on the Capitol. The FBI issued a report on its field office on January 5th that detailed the calls for violence, including those that suggested protesters go to the Capitol ready for war. I actually just in the last 24 hours was informed by the department that we actually had received the report, Sun said in response to, to a question from Amy Klobuchar. The Washington Post earlier cited Sun regarding the responses to his warnings from the House and the Senate's respective Sergeant at Arms, quote, House Sergeant at Arms Paul Irving said he wasn't comfortable, quote, with the optics of declaring an emergency ahead of the demonstration, Sun said. Meanwhile, the Senate Sergeant at Arms, Michael Stenger, suggested that Sun should informally seek out his guard contacts, asking them to lean forward and be on alert in case the Capitol Police need their help. So you've got Paul Irving, who is the House of Representatives Sergeant at Arms, apparently now being attributed that quote, that the optics just weren't right. And that's why they didn't move forward with that. So the Senate Sergeant at Arms goes over to Sund and says, go, go massage those National Guard uh, relationships and see what's 
you can come what can come out of that because we're not getting anywhere here. So finger pointing, Senate to the House, House to the Capitol Hill police, Capitol Hill police back over to the House, Sergeant at Arms, and around and around we go. There was an interesting clip from this was uh, who is this? This is Ron Johnson over from Wisconsin. He's a senator today. There was a clip flying around on Twitter this afternoon, so I wanted to play it. He spends about a minute and 17 seconds kind of going through his own analysis from another individual we're going to tell you about saying that a lot of this stuff seemed to have been uh, sort of uh, infiltrated by external individuals who were intending to come in here and sort of play the part, sort of, you know, kind of actors. This is what he said on the Senate floor today. Thousands of people I passed or who passed me along Constitution Avenue, some were indignant and con contemptuous of Congress, but not one appeared angry or incited to riot. Many of the marchers were families with small children. Many were elderly, overweight, or just plain tired or frail. Traits not typically attributed to the riot prone. Many wore pro-police shirts or carried pro-police black and blue flags. Although the crowd represented a broad cross-section of Americans, mostly working class by their appearance and manner of speech, some people stood out. A very few didn't share the jovial, friendly, earnest demeanor of the great majority. Some obviously didn't fit in, and he describes four all right, so he goes through four different categories of, of individuals who were, were there. So he's talking about this guy named Michael Waller, and this was posted over on thefederalist.com. And here is a little su a summation of what his arguments are. I saw provocateurs at the Capitol riot on January 6th. He posted this back on January 14th. He says, the deadly riot at the U.S. Capitol bore the makings of an organized operation planned well in advance of the January 6th joint session of Congress. A small number of cadre appeared to be uh, to use the cover of a huge rally to stage its attack. Before it began, I saw from my vantage point on the west front of the Capitol what appeared to be four separate cells or units. Plainclothes militants, militant aggressive men in Donald Trump and MAGA gear at the front police line at the base of the temporary presidential inaugural platform. Agents provocateurs, scattered groups of men exhorting the marchers to gather closely and tightly towards the center of the outside of the Capitol building and prevent them from leaving. Fake Trump protesters, a few young men wearing Trump or MAGA hats backwards who did not fit in with the rest of the crowd in terms of their actions or demeanor, whom I presume to be Antifa or other leftist agitators and... Number four, disciplined, uniformed column of attackers, a column of organized, disciplined men wearing similar but not identical camouflage uniforms and black gear, some with helmets and GoPro cameras, or wearing some dude Punisher skull patches. All of these cells or groups stood out from the very large crowd by their behavior and overall demeanor. However, they did not at all appear at the same time. Not until the very end did it appear that there was a prearranged plan to storm the Capitol building and to manipulate the unsuspecting crowd as cover and as a follow on force. And so, you know, it this sort of gets into that, uh, you know, the allegations here is anybody who's talking about this stuff is probably a conspiratorial person, somebody who's a conspiracy theorist. This is all nonsense. And even, you know, even from my perspective, when I was sort of watching this all unfold, I just didn't really see any evidence of Antifa. Now, that may be because they were wearing Trump gear and it's hard to identify Antifa or any other agent provocateurs that are dis disguised, right? They do not want to be discovered in that way but we just didn't see any evidence of it now this guy is coming out now it's on the floor of the senate where they're sort of t asking these questions and i think that they are interesting questions i think they're pertinent questions that that should be uh, sort of uh asked and should be investigated because if there is any of this evidence going if there is any malfeasance here that should also be rooted out okay if they were legitimate trump supporters and they're responsible for it they should be prosecuted. I've been very consistent about that. And if somebody was was part of Antifa, somebody was part of BLM, somebody was part of another organization, and they just put on a Trump hat and carried a flag with a MAGA shirt on and stormed the Capitol building, well, we should know that, right? Because right now what's happening is what the Senate is doing by Amy Klobuchar's own admissions, she's saying these were extremist groups and white supremacists. So they're labeling who they believe to be the proprietor of this the provocateurs, the insurrectionists. And so you got to get that label right, right? If it's more than just that, then we should know about it. And it sounds like now some people in, in the Senate are actually asking that question. So I'm for more information, more investigations, more evidence, more transparency, more accountability. But that means they got to be asking the right questions and of the right people. They can't just pick up a narrative that they like to run with and then start passing policies that are responsive to their make-believe narrative.
We'll see if we get there. Now, this guy is not just some random blogger, okay? J. Michael Waller is a senior analyst for strategy at the Center for Security Policy. So this is his day job, senior analyst. His areas of concentration are propaganda, political warfare, psychological warfare, subversion. He's a former professor at the Institute of World Politics, a graduate school in Washington, D.C. He's a former instructor with the Naval Postgraduate School. He's an instructor lecturer at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center and school at Fort Bragg. Okay, so that's that is when I, when I sort of am and sort of pontificating here about this stuff, at least in terms of an, an intelligence operation, uh, you know, right? That's not my expertise, but this guy that is his expertise, and so he is coming out now and saying, "Well, we kind of we we saw some anomalies, we saw some weird things happening," and I think it's worth investigating. Now. We also have some other information about this. When I talk a lot about narratives, when I talk a lot about the media sort of just spitting out propaganda largely, they're coming to conclusions that are not based on facts. They're doing it to put forward a political end. And weeks and months pass by and suddenly we learn that it's not actually what they said it is. It's not actually true. What they were reporting on is fake news. It's not real. And today there was a breaking story that this came over as an exclusive from the Daily Mail. And they are saying they, they had a conversation with Brian Sicknick, his mother, and she's saying that, no, it probably wasn't directly related to the Capitol Hill riots. His death wasn't directly related to it. Here is this article. It says he was the martyred face of the Capitol riot, but now the mother of the hero cop, Brian Sicknick, says she believes her son died of a fatal stroke, not a fire extinguisher to the head, while authorities won't say a word. And so we're going to go through this story. The, 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 the framing here is, you know, I don't want to make Officer Brian Sicknick's death a political statement at all. I have no intention of doing that. We, we keep talking about it because the government is not telling us more information about what happened. That is really my problem with this. If the MAGA protesters killed Officer Brian Sicknick, they should be condemned totally and they should be prosecuted. If they didn't, then we got to be very clear that nobody is being prosecuted for something that they didn't do. If they're going to be using his death as sort of this political bludgeon, against all of the Capitol Hill rioters. we got to be careful about that because there are going to be people who are going to prison and going to jail as a result of just being there, just being in that general vicinity. We've already covered several different individuals who've been indicted on a federal level because they were in the, the area sending text messages. And so what, what the, the Justice Department is doing right now is they are building cases that they are going to be moving forward and prosecuting. And the public, as far as we can tell right now, thinks that the MAGA people went and threw a fire extinguisher at this officer and killed him. That's not true. And you got to understand that when people are going through the criminal justice system, they're going to be judged or potentially judged if their case goes to a jury trial by a jury of their peers. And a lot of people here are hearing bad information. They're hearing basically lies from the media that is continuing to put forward this this false narrative that the MAGA people killed Officer Sicknick. And that just doesn't look like it's true. And the government, this is my, this is my ultimate problem with this, is that they're not giving us any more information about it. They could come back out. They've done an autopsy. He's already been cremated and they could give us more information. His own mother doesn't have any information about how he died. Let's go into this story. Here it is. The mother of the U.S. Capitol Police officer who died following the January 6 riots believes that her son succumbed to a fatal stroke, that he was not bludgeoned to death by a fire extinguisher as reported. Yet more than one month after, after Officer Sicknick's death on January 7th, she has admitted that they are still in the dark as to what exactly caused that catastrophic episode. Speaking exclusively to the Daily Mail, we have Gladys Sicknick, who's 74, was unequivocal in her assertion that Officer Officer Brian Sicknick was not struck in the head and that as far as the family knows, her son had a fatal stroke, right? And that's, a, that's awful. That's terrible. I, I, I empathize with the Sicknick family. I hope they recover well. I'm sorry for their loss, but that's a big difference between MAGA murdered a police officer and officer had a stroke after some interaction, after the Capitol Hill interaction. And you could even say, yeah, maybe it was the stress it was the pressure. It was the adrenaline. Who knows? Okay. I'm not a medical doctor either. So 
there, there could be a number of reasons as to as to how at least legally you could make the connection that they they did result you know they did kill him because they caused the protest he showed up at the protest he his body didn't respond well to that and he died so you could say yes if you wanted to be very granular on causation you could say that had that not happened maybe he would not have died but maybe he would have maybe he would have just gotten up and gone to work just the, the regular day no riot at the capitol building the next morning january 7th he has a stroke it's a tragic thing. But what they're trying to do is create this, this false equivalency between two things that just hasn't been proven yet. And the government is not telling us what happened here. And they're also not telling his own mother, who's 74 years old, God bless her. She said he wasn't hit in the head. No, we think he had a stroke, but we don't know anything for sure. We'd love to know what happened. So would we. We have, uh, it says here, because while politicians have grandstanded and rushed to judgment, no one yet has given the family the answers they need. The first reports that an officer had been killed were premature and emerged on January 6th. U.S. Capitol Police were swift to issue a denial, even though the New York Times and many others ran with them until very recently. It is now, it is not known that Officer Sicknick, it is now known that Officer Sicknick was on life support at the time and his death was confirmed barely 24 hours later at 9.30 on January 7th. The official statement was measured and vague as to the cause. According to the police, he passed away due to injuries sustained while on duty. And we, we read through that. And I, I think that is still, still up for debate. Daily Mail has confirmed with Douglas uh, Buchanan, the chief of communications for D.C.'s Department of Fire and Emergency, the Sicknick was not rushed to the hospital from the Capitol, but indeed returned to his division department as stated. In fact, the very that very day, the New York Times account ran Sicknick uh, account ran. Sicknick's own brother, Ken, spoke with ProPublica and said that his brother had been in good spirits and had texted him after returning to the department. He said he texted me last night and said, I got pepper sprayed twice and he was in good shape. It continued. Officer Sicknick was responding to the riots on Wednesday at the Capitol and was injured while physically engaging with protesters. He returned to the division and collapsed. He was taken to the hospital where he succumbed to his injuries. Yet despite this statement, which was issued on January 7th, the following day on January 8th, the New York Times were reporting that pro-Trump supporters overpowered Mr. Sicknick, struck him in the head with a fire extinguisher, according to two law enforcement officials. So who are those? With a bloody gash in his head, Mr. Sicknick was rushed to the hospital and placed on life support, which is just not accurate. The New York Times said that's just not right. If they have two law enforcement officials who said that, who are they? Well, they're not going to reveal their sources, but we got, I mean, we got some, some straight lies going on here in the New York Times, and they were doing it for a political reason. This is not just, oh, sorry, we, we misspelled your name. No, no, no. This is, there's a clear narrative that they want to ensure is making it into the headlines. This was the same narrative, by the way, that also appeared in the Democrat, in their memorandum that supplemented their article of impeachment. Why? Because it's a good talking point. It's a good narrative. It serves their political ends. And so they wanted to milk the hell out of it. The same day, January, which is sick, by the way, it's sick that they would want to milk this man's death for their political ends. On January 8th, Sicknick's father, Charles, 81, told Reuters that on January 7th, as they rushed from their homes in New Jersey to D.C., the family were told that Sicknick had a blood clot on his brain, had suffered a stroke. He was being kept alive on a ventilator, but was dead by the time they got there. Yet these few publicly available facts were bulldozed over by political fervor, and it was the unattributed account of a brutal attack also reported by the Associated Press that gained traction less than 24 hours after his death with no autopsy, no confirmation of any sign of blunt trauma, no investigation nor due process house speaker pelosi called for the perpetrators of sicknick's attack to be brought to justice and avowed we will never forget and we saw this and we saw this basically 24 7 trump maga people killed and murdered a police officer everybody was just was just head over heels excited with the fact that they could pin trump supporters with the murder of a cop and there was no evidence for it zero the media was already prosecuting and convicting an entire group of people without any evidence. And now that it's sort of coming out, it's still pretty hush-hush about that. All right, it goes on. On January 10th, when video emerged of a rioter hurling a fire extinguisher towards law enforcement on the steps on the Capitol, it was co-opted into the narrative of evidence of the protesters' lethal force. Four days later, retired Philadelphia firefighter Robert Sanford, 55, was arrested as the rioter in the video. His charges included assault of a police officer, disorderly conduct, civil disorder, unlawful entry. The fire extinguisher he hurled, reported by the AP to have bounced off the heads of three officers, 
two of whom were wearing helmets. None of the charges related to Officer Sicknick, yet the narrative continued to run unchecked with not one leader acknowledging the ongoing investigation or the complete absence of any certainty amid the melee of misreporting. Today, more than a month after his death, the medical examiner has yet to return a cause of death. There it is. The medical examiner has yet to return a cause of death and the FBI and the federal prosecutors are struggling to put together a murder case. Last week, it emerged that new video evidence is being examined in a bid to identify the suspects. We covered that. And anything that might help establish what led to his death, a death is still being treated as a homicide despite evidence of a cause of death or any persons of interest. Unconfirmed reports suggested investigators are now considering an adverse reaction to the bear spray with which rioters sprayed cops as a potential factor. If Officer Sicknick was suffering any such ill effects from inhaling the chemicals that clouded the air that day, he was unaware of them or simply did not treat, uh, seek treatment at the scene. But speaking to Reuters shortly after his son's death, Sicknick's father, Charles, 81, said that his son has been resuscitated twice on the way to hospital and placed on a ventilator on arrival. So you can just see right they're 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 asking questions they're investigating these guys they're all just pointing fingers at one another and we still don't have almost any evidence we have we have no real no real indication about what happened here uh the metro police chief he got an email we have a phone call from steven sund over to paul irving the sergeant at arms in the house he says oh, I, I remember that call which was a pretty important call on a pretty important day just don't remember it but the senate house sergeant the senate sergeant at arms was also there too so all right We'll just, I guess we're going to continue to just kind of play patty cake with this whole thing. And they're going to continue to talk about whatever they want to talk about. Let's jump into some questions. We've got Nadarb Lassier says, also, why do they need these hearings? I thought they already knew what caused this. I thought Trump caused the whole thing. So no need for a whole investigation, right? Yeah, right. That's exactly what they said. But not anymore, though, because Trump got acquitted. He wasn't convicted. So now apparently it wasn't him. Now it's white supremacists and extremist groups, which, by the way, serves their interests pretty nicely. Because now they're going to be able to pass a bunch of legislation now that they really got to the bottom of this. Now it's not Trump. Oh, whoops, sorry. We went through a whole impeachment proceeding, but we knew and you knew and all of the law enforcement agencies at, on D.C., they knew as well that there is a massive pre-planned or non-organic military style operation that was already well underway before January 6th. We all knew that, but apparently we just had to go through the Trump debacle for giggles. We have another one from just XUXA. Have they figured out how many people were in DC for the rally? You know, I don't, I don't know that I saw a final number on that. Uh, a lot. I don't really know how many were there. Good question though. Sharon Quidney says this whole thing just serves their political agenda. I just wish somebody would stand up and say, Hey, I thought it was all Trump's fault. Why doesn't somebody just stand up and call them out on that? Yeah. Well, I don't know because this is all political security theater. In my opinion, you know, it's, it's a spectacle that they're just going to call them up. We ask them questions. They're all going to point fingers at each other. And who knows if anything changes? I think that uh, there should be a much, much deeper investigation into it. I think that this was a, a catastrophic failure that somebody, some, something needs to happen to somebody over this stuff. Now, a lot of people have resigned and been fired, but you know, that we're, we're talking about a, a, a very serious situation and it feels like the government was grossly negligent in preventing it from happening all multiple failures across multiple agencies multiple sergeant of arms two different police departments an fbi and others who all failed to prevent this thing what the hell are they doing if they can't even protect a building in our homeland in the heart of washington dc we expect them to go out and govern military operations across the world when they can't even protect a single building with massive amounts of intelligence that they can gather from everything that's going on in this country, it's embarrassing. We have Pinky2 says, if it was a phone call, don't they have the ability to see that? If, if they asked, yeah, I think so, Pinky, if they asked the questions, if they said, okay, all right, Mr. Irving, we're going to uh, subpoena your phone records. Apparently, you don't remember that call. Steven Sun does remember that call. He's looking at some sort of a record. Is that his phone log? I don't know. Maybe he pulled his records from whatever you know network he's on, and now he can refer back specifically to this date and time at this location. This is what I said. What happened to the other guy? Why doesn't he remember that call? Jeremy Matrita says, I would like to know your opinion on the use of selective amnesia as a defense in a criminal defense. Not a good defense, doesn't work. Little creative, 
No, I don't remember. It's strange, right? Happens a lot, though. This happens all the time. I don't, I don't know. This usually happens not really in a criminal trial because you sort, of, you sort of work these issues out. But yeah, when you're in a congressional hearing, you suddenly have the I have no recollection. Hey, I'm Paul Irving. Hey, you were there at the Capitol building that day, right? It was one of like the, the most traumatic things that's ever happened in this country, at least in your lifetime, right? You were there, you're responsible for security. This is your entire job to make sure this stuff doesn't happen. And you can't recall a phone call that came in on that day. You don't remember talking to Steven Sund about this at 109 or two or 250 or whatever. All right. So uh, uh, maybe he has amnesia. Maybe he's got dementia. May who knows? But he certainly should not be in any security apparatus anytime ever again because he can't remember anything that happened on a very important day. We have Sharon Quinn. He says the infiltration slip was interesting. Could it be that there was somebody on the inside helping out? If not, why the videos of cops letting people into the building? Good question. And actually, I saw another headline today that we didn't get to, but we're going to see if we can get it tomorrow is there's there's a, a new evidence. I don't know the details of the story, but apparently I think the FBI is actually pulling congressional phone records now. So they got a subpoena and they're going to be diving in to see what these Congress people were doing. And I want to know, right, if there were Congress people, I don't care what party they're a part of. If there were people giving other insurrectionists or rioters tours, if they were complicit in any of this, they all got to be rooted out, right? Congress doesn't escape a look down the microscope here. Everybody in that in that building, if anybody has a hint of you know enabling this stuff, they should be prosecuted. They should be investigated because they're doing it to everybody else. And that includes the Republicans. We have another one from Sach says, I think we are really missing the point here. From my understanding, the contingency plan for the Capitol Police during such an event on January 6th is the deployment of the National Guard. The fact that the deployment of the Guard was delayed potentially deliberately is very bad, but the blame should not be placed on the Capitol Police chief in order for them to be ready for such a situation that occurred would mean that they would have militarized. They would have to militarize the Capitol Police even further. Yeah, you know, such I'm not particularly concerned here. We, yours is continuing to continue that last bit. I think to milita militarize the Capitol Police even further is scary. They should focus on expediting the process for deploying the National Guard to make sure there is a garrison close enough to respond effectively. Yeah, I'm not trying to beat up on Stephen Sun here. I think Stephen Sun is probably the only person who has been straight with all of us about what actually took place. So he resigned immediately. He has said pretty consistently that one of the reasons that the National Guard request was denied was from optics. That was a same that was also confirmed by the Metro DC police chief. I don't have his name in front of me. He, he basically said that, right? Uh, they were talking about optics. Who was talking about optics? Paul Irving, who was the house sergeant at arms, who was on record today saying, I don't remember the phone call. So it, it's about who did what and when, and apparently there was requests for National Guards and they were not delivered. And that is the question. Why not? And why did Mayor Bowser on January 5th send a letter specifically saying, don't send any more federal resources over here. We don't want them. Why did they do that? Hindsight is 2020. I get it. But these are the same people who've been screaming from the rooftops that Trump is a maniac and that all of his supporters are white supremacist, insurrectionist extremists. So if they thought that and they believed that, then why were they the ones not just saying, well, we're just going to uh, sort of maintain the status quo and just, and just kind of go about our business as usual? No, active requests for no new support, actively writing letters and saying, don't send anyone else. FBI, if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about the National Guard, we don't want them here. Why? Why is that? Why wouldn't you want them there? If, you, if you're Mayor Bowser, you're a Democrat, you think that Trump is a maniac, why are you, are you specifically actively going out there and declining additional resources? Why would that be? I don't know. Maybe somebody will ask them when we have a real hearing. We have Nabarb, Nadarb Lassier says, has anyone been charged in any way connected to white supremacy as in gang charges? You would think there would be an extra charge for be, being affiliated with a gang while doing that. So I, I haven't seen anybody, Nadar. We kind of stopped covering some of the uh, the indictments because there's a lot of them. There's just there's so many of them. A lot of people are being prosecuted right now, as they should be. And I have not seen any of those gang terms. But maybe we will. 
Sach says, if the Capitol Police could have handled the situation, there would be no reason for the National Guard. If the delay was intentional, they need to hold people accountable. Seems the sergeant of the guard are protecting Pelosi. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Pelosi. I don't care if it's Mitch McConnell. I don't care if it's a sergeant at arms for either house. If there was a stand down order or if there was, you know, hey, Stephen Sun says, I called you at 109 and Paul Irving dithered until 209. Why, why, why is that? You are directly responsible for security. Why didn't that come in? Good question. Another one from Sharon Quidney says, all of this, quote, white supremacy talk is very scary. It's just like that Coca-Cola business forcing people to confess to evil whiteness. This is totally scary. It's blatant racism, and it has to be called out. And you are doing that, Sharon. Thanks for calling it out. Yeah, I saw a good meme. Coca-Cola is now woke cola Isn't that funny? I had a good laugh at that. We have, which is not, not actually that funny. We have Rebelling My Way says, did they need an FBI report? Didn't most people know something was going to happen that day? I... Yes, they did. <laughs> they all knew. They all knew it. Uh, all of the intelligence communities knew it. Everybody knew it was going to go on, but they were more concerned about optics. They were more concerned about, I don't know what. Mayor Bowser said, we went through the letter on January 5th. We don't want any more help. Why not? I don't know. Somebody should ask her. Somebody should bring her up there and ask her. Yeah, everybody knew something was going to happen. Everybody knew it was going to be a big deal. Nobody thought it was going to be what it turned out to be. And most of us, we're not responsible for the security on Capitol Hill. We're not responsible for Washington, D.C. and protecting the entire city and our base of our federal government. That's for other people. That's their entire job. We give them billions and billions and billions of dollars to do that. And they all failed. Why? Ma says... The Proud Boys were the first people to arrive at the Capitol. They were watching the Trump speech while waiting to approach the Capitol. They actually did this on camera, and many of the large names of the groups were there. There is a good documentary on what happened at the beginning elsewhere if you want it at a later time. Well, thank you, Ma, for that. You know, I, I, I am, I'm very curious to see how all this always, how this all plays out. Let's say, you know, six months from now. What, what, uh, what is the history of this thing? How does that look? Thank you, Ma. We have Robert says, I tend to agree with Senator Johnson. I've spoken with several people who were there, and they said everyone around them was typical MAGA supporters. There were children and elderly. Also, the fact that two networks played John Sullivan, 35000 each, leads to a lot of questions. Yeah, we covered that story too, right? CNN was paying this John Sullivan character, who is former BLM, former Antifa. Nobody wants him as part of the group anymore. Once you're caught, everybody disavows you. And so that's what happened with John Sullivan. But why did he make $70,000 for his footage? Very good question. Want to know, says Rob, when this goes to trial, how do you pick a jury that is truly fair, that doesn't have some kind of option? Can you believe, can you believe ask them, you watch Fox or CNN, ABC, all totally different views? So I think you're asking is, can you, can you ask them those questions? And yeah, you can actually, this is going to depend a, a lot on what the judge wants to do. So the judge has, at least here in Arizona, a lot of discretion about what's called void deer, which is the process before a jury trial where you get to ask the juror questions. Some judges, the way they like to do it is they will uh, ask people to sort of, you know, raise their hands or identify themselves. So let's say you're in a DUI case, a judge might say uh, to the entire jury panel, you know, 40 people, they'll say, uh, has anybody here uh, been impacted adversely by a DUI? Right? Somebody raises up and they say, yes, ma'am. What's your name? Oh, I'm Barbara. Uh, you know, I got hit by a drunk driver in 1987 and um, I'm scared of driving on the road. And so she, she brings up why she's not a good fit to be a juror. And the defense attorney goes, oh, Barbara, We're, we got to get rid of her because she got hit by a drunk driver. She's not going to support our client. Uh, in this case, she's going to uh, prejudge him guilty. And so, you know, you, you sort of identify jurors that way. Then you can, you know, clear people out. I've got a conflict. I've got this. And, uh, and then you can go into a, a deeper line of questioning. So you can, as soon as some of the obvious people are sort of stricken from the, the pool, then you can dive in and call jurors in individually. So you'll call them in and you'll say, hey, uh, I noticed on question nine, when we were talking about, uh, you know, what are your views on law enforcement that you said X, Y, and Z about police, that sounds like, you know, you may not like the cops. And so the prosecutors over there scribbling names down because they want to eject that person. And that's when you can sort of dive in. You can say, well, why, what, what happened? You know, so tell me about why you have this bad interaction with the police. Okay. And on this story, what did you hear? Oh, okay. So you watch Fox News and is that, and then what you're trying to do, depending on what side of the aisle you're on, if you're a, a prosecutor and you want to keep them, you're going to try to rehabilitate that person. Oh, okay. So you were hit in 1987 by a drunk driver. But that was a long time ago, right? Yes. And do you have any lingering animosity about that? Do you? Do you have any lingering animosity? And she goes, 
No, I don't. It's um, no, you're right. No, I, I can be I can be fair. Oh, so you can be fair and impartial here. Perfect. So the prosecutor is going to want to keep them. Meanwhile, at the defense over here, we're throwing our hands up in the air. Judge, she's you know, she's been impacted by it. She's not going to be fair and impartial. And so you can just really battle it out over that stuff. But you're going to get a lot of people who come in, they want to be a part of a jury, they, they're, they're excited about it, yay, I get to sit on a jury, I get to judge people, this is fun, and they're just, they, they come in with a preconceived notion, most of the time they think your client's already guilty before any evidence has been presented, and the judges will ask them questions about that also. The judge will say, uh, how many people here um, think that, that this person that you see sitting over here is guilty? Okay, before the trial even starts, before opening arguments even start, we're doing void deal, we're asking the jurors questions to see whether they can be on the panel or not. And so the judge will say, does anybody think this guy's guilty? And you'll have half the jury panel goes, yeah, I do. Well, he got charged. And well, sir, why do you think? Well, he got charged with a crime and he is uh, obviously the cops are here and you know, he looks guilty to me. And so all of those people are now being written down. Okay. Those are all going to be objections. We're going to try to strike those jurors. Probably the next question is, how many people here uh, think that they can't tell whether he's guilty or not? So question one, is he guilty? Half the room. Okay, so for those of you who didn't raise your hand, how many people think that at this moment in time, before the trial has even started, that he's, that you don't know? You, you can't decide right now whether he's guilty or innocent. And you get another, I don't know, half of the remainders that say, yeah, I don't know. I just don't know whether he's guilty or not. We haven't heard any evidence. I think this is the right answer. So I'm going to raise my hand because we don't know. No, no evidence has been presented yet. The trial hasn't even started. And the judge goes, okay, so that's also wrong because we have the presumption of innocence in this country. Technically right now, this man sitting here is innocent. All of you who raised your hand in those last two questions, you're all wrong. The people who didn't raise their hand and said, no, he's innocent at this moment, which is usually like two people. They all, you know, they, they're, they're actually right. The presumption of innocence applies and it starts right there. And so you can see how this void year process can go on for a long time and it can be very complicated. I went way too long discussing that, but uh, it's a fun topic to get into. We've got Ma Fox who says, it's because this investigation is to stop this from happening in the future. It's about fixing procedure, not pointing fingers. Well, Ma, you are a very reasonable person. That's one part of why I'm interested in it. The other point is to point the fingers. Who the hell is responsible for this? I think part of fixing the procedure is making sure that the people who are responsible for a botched procedure or people who might have some malfeasance in it, they may have just been you know, delaying it. This may have been good for them. There may be some alternative motives here. Those people need to be identified. And the only way we can do that is by pointing our fingers right at them and saying, you botched this. You're not allowed back in our security in infrastructure anymore. Thanks for playing the game. You botched it. You're out now. So I am interested in that. You're much more diplomatic than I am, though, Ma. We have Tacky Sajahar. Tack we have, whoa, we got Seji back in the house. He says, just tuned in like 40 minutes in. Robert, I would argue that those that the house contacted are not big tech, but rather big comms. That's probably fair. Bigcom has to focus on markets between intra-America and inter-America. I think that is the proper use of those prefixes. The internet is not necessarily an intranet, I believe. Bigcom seems to be more big capitalist than Bigcom E. So it's good to see you, Seji. We haven't, uh, we have not uh, seen you in a while. I'm glad that you're back. We have Josh Sesco says, "Hey Robert, have you seen the word? Have you seen the clip of Biden fumbling the words and letting that N word slip out? I actually have seen that. He's trying to, he was trying to." You know, I, I don't think it's it's a I don't think it's actually that word. I think it's just sort of a combination of two words that kind of sounds like that word. And so you know, I watched it and it's not uh, it's not good. You know, it's it's not good. I don't B Biden is just mumbling all over the place and he just he just remember uh, remember that he was going to bring true international little, little, little pressure on, uh, on the whole the whole world. I think he was trying to say true international diplomatic pressure on the Iranians, but he said, true, a little, a little pressure. And he just consolidated all those words into one word. I think he was doing the same thing and a very bad word came out of his mouth. So not too good there for Joe Biden. All right. So we're going to wrap up that segment. That was a long one. We still, oh my gosh, we have so much more to get to. I spent way too much time on that, but there's some good stuff there and it gets me hot. 